Chapter 19, we'll be taking a look at the organization and regulation of eukaryotic genomes. As we can see, only a very small percentage of the eukaryotic genome contains sequences that code for either protein or various forms of RNA instrumental in gene expression. The remainder of the eukaryotic genome is comprised mainly of non-coding, repetitive sequences. Some of the repetitive sequences throughout the eukaryotic genome are known as transposons or transposable elements. Transposons or transposable elements are DNA entities capable of replicating and inserting themselves throughout the genome. Some transposons are removed from the DNA molecule and then inserted into another molecule, thus jumping from one locus in the genome to another. Other transposons can actually make copies of themselves before being inserted at a different locus. Still others employ an RNA intermediate, whereby the RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA, which is then inserted at a locus elsewhere in the genome. The actions of transposons can actually interfere with gene expression. Transposable elements were first identified in the work of Barbara McClintock, who was studying inheritance patterns in maize or Indian corn. And through her work, she realized that the insertion of transposable elements may actually alter or suppress gene expression. In maize, kernels that are uniformly purple in color contain a gene that produces said purple pigment. In her work, Barbara McClintock showed that the insertion of a transposon into this gene silenced its expression. Therefore, the kernels appeared uniformly white. There were some kernels, however, described as being speckled, that had some regions expressing the purple phenotype, whereas others were uniformly white. In these particular kernels, only some cells maintained the normal gene producing purple pigment, whereas the other cells had this gene that was interrupted by the insertion of a transposon. Thus, we have further illustration that transposable elements can alter or silence the expression of genes. Chapter 19, we're going to be taking a look at how the eukaryotic genome is regulated. Although all cells in the human body possess the exact same genome, the types of genes expressed in a cell type varies. Genes that are expressed in all cell types are commonly referred to as housekeeping genes, whereas those genes that are expressed in specific cells and are responsible for the characteristics that typify a specific cell type are known as as tissue-specific genes. The regulation of the eukaryotic genome leading to the differential development of cell types can occur in a number of different ways. Methods associated with transcriptional control, messenger RNA processing or degradation, translational control, and even the modification of proteins post-translation can all have a significant influence on the development and establishment of a particular cell type. In regards to transcriptional control of gene regulation, regulatory elements known as activators can associate with regions known as enhancers that lie upstream from a gene. 
when an activator interacts with an enhancer region, it promotes the binding of various transcription factors to the promoter region of a gene, thus increasing or upregulating the transcription rate of a gene. As we can see in this diagram here, the placement of the enhancers and their location relative to a gene sequence does not have any effect whatsoever on the rate at which a gene is transcribed. In other words, as long as the enhancer regions are present and there's a sufficient number of activators, a gene will be transcribed at a very high rate. Conversely, regulatory elements known as repressors can bind to this enhancer region and thus block or downregulate the rate of transcription. Repressors can do this in either one of two ways. First off, the binding of a repressor to the enhancer region can block the promoter region of the gene from associating with vital transcription factors. Secondly, a repressor can physically block the enhancer from associating with activators. Both of these mechanisms have the effect of blocking transcription or downregulating the rate at which this process occurs. Thus, we can see that repressors can contribute to cell differentiation by selectively repressing or silencing the expression of certain genes in certain cells. Another method by which genes can be regulated by way of transcriptional control is through a process known as chromatin remodeling. Chromatin remodeling usually is associated with the addition of either acetyl or methyl groups to the DNA. With regards to the acetylation of the DNA molecule, this process tends to lessen the attraction of the DNA with histone protein complexes. Therefore, the DNA becomes more loosely packed, therefore exposing various regulatory regions, such as enhancers, which tend to promote gene transcription. In short, acetylation tends to upregulate the rate of transcription and therefore enhances the expression of a gene. Conversely, methylation of the DNA tends to have the opposite effect, whereby the DNA becomes more tightly associated with these histone protein complexes, thus masking these vital regulatory regions, and therefore transcription tends to be down-regulated and gene expression more or less is silenced. Before, the acetylation or methylation of the DNA molecule can be heritable uh, within a single generation. So, DNA methylation, DNA acetylation, is regarded as an epigenetic change. Remember, epigenetic changes do not change the sequence of bases within the DNA molecule, but it does change the structure of the DNA molecule, which may alter the manner in which genes are expressed. For example, we can see how the methylation of DNA can be passed from one cell generation to another. During DNA replication, an enzyme known as DNA methyltransferase will recognize partially or hemimethylated DNA strands and therefore will add methyl groups to corresponding loci on the new complementary strand. Therefore, the methylation within a given region of the DNA molecule is preserved from one generation to the next. 
addition to various transcriptional control mechanisms, there are also differences in the manner in which RNA is processed that can influence gene expression and the characteristics that a particular cell type manifests. We consider this primary RNA transcript, or pre-RNA molecule. In some cells, this pre-RNA molecule will be processed by spliceosomes in sometimes markedly different manners. In our first example here, the pre-mRNA molecule has been processed such that all of the exons have been retained and therefore only the introns have been removed. As a result, a particular polypeptide and protein product having a specific function within the cell will be produced. In the second example, however, exon number three has been treated as if it were an intron. As a result, it has been edited out and therefore, as a result of translation, a slightly different protein product having a slightly different effect on cellular metabolism will be produced. In the last example, it is exon 4 that has been treated as an intron and has been edited out by a spliceosome. As a result of the translational process, still another different polypeptide and protein product will be made, and therefore this is expected to also have a different effect on cellular metabolism as well as cellular development. Another means of transcriptional control of the eukaryotic genome involves the activity of small double-stranded RNA molecules that can interfere with the messenger RNA being translated into a polypeptide product. Therefore, these molecules are involved in a phenomenon known as RNA interference, or RNAi. There are two forms of double-stranded RNA molecules that are involved in this form of eukaryotic gene regulation. They are known as microRNAs and small interfering RNAs. RNA and short interfering RNA can block transcription and thus gene expression in the following way. The pre-MI or SI RNA can base pair with itself to form what is often referred to as a hairpin structure which will then associate with an enzyme known as dicer. Dicer will convert this hairpin structure into a double-stranded MI or SI RNA molecule. This molecule will then associate with what is known as an RNA-induced silencing complex, whereupon one of the strands of the double-stranded messenger RNA molecule will be degraded away. This will leave the single strand free to base pair with various cellular messenger RNA transcripts. Depending on whether or not the single-stranded molecule associated with the RNA-induced silencing complex is an siRNA or an miRNA, this will determine the fate of the messenger RNA molecule that it base pairs with. If this molecule is an siRNA molecule, it will exhibit a high degree of complementarity with its bound messenger RNA molecule, in which case the messenger RNA molecule will be degraded. If, on the other hand, this molecule is an miRNA, which tends to have a low degree of complementarity with the messenger RNA molecule that it associates with, 
it will just remain bound with the molecule. In both cases, the cellular RNA will not be able to associate with a ribosome and transfer RNA, and therefore its genetic code will never have an opportunity to be translated into a polypeptide product. So therefore, in summary, RNA interference is a mechanism that produces these RNA entities, MI or SI RNA entities, that are selectively active in some cell types and not in others. And as a result, certain genes will be selectively silenced, and this will lead to the differential development of certain cell types.